If you love someone, hug them right now. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Yeah, was gonna they're doing it. That's the end of the story. Well, okay, not the end, because if it were the end, I wouldn't be here right now, right here on stage with you. It's definitely not the beginning. I mean, I have no idea where to begin this story. There's so many places that would make sense. Uh, I, could, I could start with my dad being born in Kankakee. There's somebody from Kankakee out here. <laughs> I could start when I was born and he and my, my, my mom uh, adopted me. I could start when Kate and I got married. I could start with a phone call. But for now, I'm going to start this speech this way with if you love someone, hug them right now. It's how I end every radio show that I host, and there's a good reason. So, it's December 19th, 2010, six days before Christmas. And let me just set the scene for you. There's Christmas music playing in our house. There are caterers in the kitchen making food. And the first floor of our house is cleared of all the furniture because you see an hour from now is the annual Christmas party in our house and I'm not dressed yet, I haven't had time and I'm running around and so I'm just racing up the stairs to change my clothes. And this party had become an annual tradition for us, for all of our best friends and family. It's it kind of a big, big night for us. Ring, ring, it's the phone. I say hello, there's a pause at the other end. My brother-in-law hears the Christmas music and he says, I can't do this to you right now. I know there's something very wrong. I say, what, tell me. You can't say that and then not tell me. I throw the phone as hard as I can across the room. I run out the door and I don't stop running. I'm on the stairs. When I hear Chris scream and I see him throw the phone across the room and he's screaming F-bombs over and over and he runs out the door and the phone lands on the couch and I'm so confused. I run over, I pick up the phone and I go, who? I'm shaking and I said, who is this? And it's my brother-in-law. And he says, um, I'm not going to tell you exactly what he says. But he basically says, John Bro, Chris's father, has died by suicide. And I start screaming, no, 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 no. And, and then I look, and the caterers are standing there, and they're horrified, and they're staring at me. And my kids have come down the stairs, and they're crying because they see me sobbing. And God bless the caterer who grabs the kids and takes them away, takes them upstairs to their playroom to get them out of the scene. And the one who, the caterer who got on the phone then and booked us flights to Chicago because I couldn't function. I remember the last time I saw Papa. He drove us to the airport. That Thanksgiving, it was just a few weeks before, uh, Papa always picked us up, always dropped us off. I still, to this day, my heart stops when he's not there at O'Hare. Last night when he got in, he wasn't there. After Thanksgiving, the visit, he's stopping, he drops us off at O'Hare. We get out, we start unloading the gear, putting it on the sidewalk. He comes around the edge. I give him a big hug. I say, thank you. This was a great weekend. I'll see you soon. He smiled. John was the guy. <laughs> I love that photo. <laughs> uh, John was the guy who would do anything 
for anyone. You got a garage you need painted? He'd be there. You need him to mow the lawn? Check. Fix a leak? No problem. Outwardly, he was a jovial, carefree, happy-go-lucky, funny guy. He used to do Donald Duck voices for our kids just to make them laugh. And he loved to take us out for beers, and usually the appetizer sampler platter was a big John choice. My dad would call, usually after a Bears game, hey, Chris, how about that play in the second quarter? Oh, what a great comeback. Then he'd head off the phone and say, here's your mother. Uh, we all knew my dad was struggling with depression in 2010. We didn't understand the depth of it, he was in treatment, but he was tr being treated by the general practitioner, not a specialist. We had no idea, no clue what was going to happen. Depression lies. It tells people that their family and friends are going to be better off when they're gone. Depression tells them that they'll be relieved. Depression tells them they won't be a burden anymore. It's all wrong. Uh, I'm just going to throw this out here. Uh, imagine if you could see your own funeral. Just hear me out. You can hear and see the people that love you, that care about you. I'm throwing that out because Papa's wake was just an awful day and a beautiful day. The outpouring of love and kindness for my dad was just overwhelming. The line literally went out the door. People stood in line for hours to pay their last respects. And it wasn't just family, friends, and former co-workers. It was the guys at Ace Hardware. It was the baggers from the Jewel grocery store. I guarantee there will be no baggers <laughs> at my wake. I went out to the bathroom one time, and someone from a different wake in the same building, looked at the line, saw me coming out of the wake, and asked, did the mayor die? There were so many people there that they had to keep it open an extra 90 minutes so that everyone would get a chance to say goodbye. After my dad's funeral, we gathered for a meal with extended family. Uh, we decided that this would be a good time and place to have our family remember John. When it was my turn, I talked about the many ways someone could be judged in life, uh, work, money, fame, but I suggested we should focus on John's real legacy, his kids, how he raised us, the adults uh, we turned into. Anyone that knows me in person or online uh, knows I love music. Uh, you can often hear me saying live music is good for your soul or New music keeps you young at heart. Uh, there's a lot of times in moments that my mind goes to lyrics. Uh, my speech about my dad was no different. So after I talked about each sibling, I played Alexi Murdoch's Orange Sky. A few of the lyrics go, I had a dream, I stood beneath an orange sky with my brother standing by. I said, brother, You know, it's a long road we've been walking on. I had a dream. I stood beneath an orange sky with my sister standing by. I said, sister, here's what I know now. It goes like this. In your love, my salvation lies. And our family is painfully aware that in our love is our salvation. A lot of them are, are here tonight. We love you guys. We all blamed ourselves. And I came to find out later that that is really common and really predictable and really unproductive. What did we miss? What didn't we see? What if? What if? So many what ifs. Chris and I, speaking openly, had been dealing with our own grief that Thanksgiving trip that he mentioned. We'd actually just had a miscarriage. So it was kind of that, and then this enormous, tremendous loss. Chris was really struggling. 
And there was a point when I think we both realized that we were either gonna support each other and hold each other up and get closer in our marriage or our marriage was gonna fall apart. We decided as a whole family that we would, that we wouldn't shy away from talking about all this. At first it was just within our family and friends, but as months passed, I realized, um, as Patrick said, that there were a lot of stories about mental health and substance use and suicide that really deserved to be told and not too many people were telling them and we needed to shine a light. So I started pitching those stories at work. In 2013, I came to Chicago, I'll never forget, I went on a ride along with Chicago police and we watched kids come in from the western suburbs on the train and buy heroin. And in 2014, the next year, I pushed for a series of stories that we did about substance abuse, about heroin in particular in this country, and that, that was really when things were really taking off. We actually won an Emmy for that series. Um, and in 2015, the next year, I interviewed Zelda Williams, the daughter of Robin Williams, whose father had just died, and I asked our family at that time, would it be okay in the context of that, if I mentioned our loss on national TV, and this family, to their credit, said, you should do that. They urged me to use the public platform that I have, even if it's not that big, just to try to reduce the stigma that surrounds all of this. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention saw that piece on the Today Show, and they called me and said, could you host our gala? and speak about our experience again, and so I did. And then last summer, after Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade passed away, I was reporting again on suicide, and that led to me telling a, a fuller version of, uh, there's no picture right now, but a fuller version of our family's story on TV. I think I mentioned I like music. Uh, Frank Turner wrote a song called if I ever stray. The path I choose isn't straight and narrow. It wanders around like a drunken fellow. Some days it's hard to follow, but if you've got my back, I'll go on. If you've got my back, I'll go on. Family has your back, friends have your back, and sometimes total strangers have your back. That's what we want to build, a community of support and we believe that's what this country needs, and we need to have conversation about tough topics. A few weeks ago, I wrote a piece for USA Today, um, and I started it by saying, I'm doing the best I can. That's something that I learned in therapy. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you that we've been in therapy recently. <laughs> we've actually been in a group, it's called Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, some of you are probably psychologists in the room. We've been in a parent group for the last six months. We, we just graduated. We graduated last week, actually. <laughs> I don't think you ever really graduate from DBT. I was going to say, we still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> That's one thing that I learned. I have yeah. a lot to learn. But listen, we have two teenagers. We have a 13 and a 16-year-old, six, and parenting teenagers is, is tough. They're in there. That's our whole big extended family from last summer up in Michigan. We learned a lot in that, in that group therapy, the parenting group. We learned that we can stumble and still love our kids, that we can be sad about Chris's dad, and we can still remember his Donald Duck impersonation, and we can still laugh. And just adding that word and, I don't know if you noticed that I did that, but that makes a big difference. It's a big word, sad and still getting through. Chris was at a conference earlier this year, and the speaker was talking about and in business meetings. They did an exercise where they had to come up with like a, a party and say, we'll have ice cream and cake and guacamole and clowns. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> you had me with this party until you got the clowns. <laughs> I don't love that. I like the and building on that. <laughs> so just remember that everyone you meet probably looks great on Instagram 
and they're struggling with something, right? Small things. Actually, you know what? This reminds me of a lyric. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I'm grateful for the small things today. It's by a Cracker, and it's, uh, the song is Happy Birthday to Me. And someone just had a birthday. Yeah. So I just want to say happy birthday. Thank you. And thank you for everything. <laughs> But I am thankful though for those small things and I'm starting to rethink these so-called small things because small things lead to big change. Uh, I'm beginning to think that, you know, like, like the hugs, it's a small thing, but maybe you're in a bad mood, a stranger says hi, or holds the door open in the rain, or a friend sends a happy text, or a funny gif, or gif. Or <laughs> I don't know. Jeff, uh, whatever it happens to be, your whole day can change. It can pivot with just that one simple thing, that, that small thing. And I just want us to start doing just small happy things during the day, and maybe together we can make a big change. I'm always shocked that my dad's death is still raw. As you hear, it can bubble over many different times, it's, it, and I know it's never gonna go away. And when he does pop in my head, I could be driving. A song comes on in shuffle and I'm just overtaken and I just start weeping in the car. Or I'm at church and a certain song comes on and I'm just reminded of him. I start tearing up in church, my breathing gets tight. It just, the, the hows and the whens and the whys it hits, it's just, I know it's natural, I know it's part of the process, I'm not embarrassed, but when you go through something, you just have to be ready for that rawness because you don't know when it's gonna hit and it's always unexpected. I've learned that it is okay to ask, how are you doing today? How are you today? I've learned that it's even okay to ask a friend who might be struggling if they've thought about never waking up it's okay. I've learned that listening can be the first step. Validating somebody's feelings and pointing them to professional help if that's what they need, that can make all the difference in the world. Well, it's time for us to say goodbye to this story. Thank you for listening. Uh, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't leave you with one more lyric. <laughs> I love music a lot, so music is my life, and like I said, I think in lyrics. This is from Pearl Jam. Hold me and make it the truth, because when all is lost, there will be you. Because to the universe, I don't mean a thing. And there's just that one word I still believe, and it's love. I know it's already been sung, can't be said enough, Love is all you need. All you need is love, 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 love. Thank you, Pearl Jam. Thank you, Eddie Vedder. And if you love someone, hug them right now. <laughs>